Greetings to all of you. I want to welcome all of us at uh, Center Street Church, those of us here at Center Campus, as well as those joining us from our campus in Northwest Calgary, Bridgeland, Airdrie, and South Calgary. Also want to welcome our online audience as well. Uh, we are working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and the way we will be doing it is by dividing the book into several mini sermon series. We call the first sermon series in Matthew, Revealing Jesus. Because Matthew, the gospel writer, offers us wearing portraits of Jesus in the opening chapters. Uh, today we're starting uh, the second sermon series from the gospel of Matthew that will revolve around a practical subject that we all face in our day-to-day -day life, temptations. It does not matter who you are, your age, how long you've been a Christian, or how matured you are in your faith, we all face temptation. No one is exempted. You know, interestingly, in a world that mocks at the concept of sin, temptation has been given a positive spin in our culture. If you notice, advertisements openly use the language of temptation to persuade you to buy products. A restaurant menus use this word to refer to the sweet treats to entice you. There's even a popular brand of cat food called Temptations. The product claims all you need to do is sh shake the bag and the kitty will come running. How sweet. <laughs> you know, what do we even mean by the word temptation? Clearly, its original meaning has been hijacked. Now, let me give you a simple Christian definition of the word temptation. Temptation is an enticement to act in disobedience to God's will. Temptation is a, an enticement to make you disobey God's will. See, there are many forms and kinds of temptation, but at its root, this is what is in common. It is an enticement to disobey God. Temptation in itself is not a sin, but when we give in to temptation, we consent to meeting our needs our own way as opposed to doing it God's way. Let's not forget, we are in the middle of a cosmic conflict, and Christians have been set apart to represent Jesus in this battle. The enemy will do everything in his power to extinguish our Christian influence. This unseen war is raging all around us, and Satan's primary weapon in this warfare is temptation. Uh, in this sermon series, we're going to look at the temptations of Jesus and draw lessons from it. And I want to show you first and foremost, Jesus comes across as the victorious Savior. This is the first of the many knockout blows Jesus will render on Satan and the powers of darkness. One Bible commentator observes, every time Satan and his demons show up in the Gospel of Matthew, they wear the faces of defeat. So as a representative of the new human race, Jesus has conquered the enemy on behalf of us. Secondly, Jesus shows us how to battle temptations in our life. We can learn from his example some key principles that will help us to overcome whatever temptations we are wrestling with. So in this opening sermon, I want to give us an introduction that will serve as a foundation to this sermon series. So if you're physically able, I'm going to ask you to stand to honor the reading of God's Word from Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. To chapter 4, verse 1. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Lord, you called us to live countercultural lives, lives that don't reflect the pattern of this world, lives that honor 
the principles of your word. So would you help us, even through the series, to understand the nature of temptation, the struggles and the challenges that are all around us on a regular basis, and to play the important role that we have to play in the spiritual warfare that we see all around us. So bring spiritual transformation in us through the series that our lives will align with your path and your plan for us. So come, Lord, and minister to us today in the power of your Spirit that every single one of us here will hear your voice. We give this time into your hands. We pray this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. This was in the news some time ago, a true story. A boy, eight years old in Ohio, had a sudden urge for a McDonald's cheeseburger. And the problem was, it was after he had already eaten his dinner, and his parents had fallen asleep after a long, busy day. But the urge to go to McDonald's was so strong that the eight-year-old couldn't resist the temptation any longer. So he decided to watch driving instruction videos on YouTube for a few minutes uh, before putting his four-year-old sister in his dad's minivan so they could go get their fix. And amazingly, the young driver managed to safely get through four intersections before getting to the McDonald's drive through that was about three kilometers from his house. Now, why do we even need driving schools anymore when you have YouTube, right? <laughs> when he came through to the, uh, the drive through the McDonald's staff realized that the kids were all alone in the car, so they called the cops. And the good news is they were finally able to eat their cheeseburgers while waiting for their parents to come and pick them up. And if they were my kids, they will never, ever see McDonald's for the rest of their life. <laughs> do you ever crave something so badly that you will do anything to get it? Now that seems to be the philosophy of our day and age. It's astonishing to see the amount of options that we have within our reach and with limited or no effort, we can satisfy all of our cravings. When everything is available at your fingertips, it takes great self-control to say no. And even if you don't go after things, things come chasing after you. It was Oscar Wilde who once said, I can resist everything except temptation. They look so attractive, appealing, irresistible. How do we cope with it? Now, first of all, I want all of us to know, no one is temptation free. The holiest person who ever lived was Jesus, and he even Jesus was tempted. If that is true of Jesus, then it is true of every single one of us as his followers. And sometimes we hear testimonies like a person who's a porn addict or a drug addict saying, I came to faith in Jesus, and at that very moment, Jesus uprooted my addiction. It was all gone just like that, and I have never been tempted ever since. And I want you to know, those kind of stories are rare. And I bet they don't paint the real picture. But what is common and ought to be true are stories where a person has to battle through temptation, fight hard against their sinful nature on a daily basis, take a hard stance and refuse to compromise or give in even under pressure. But there will be seasons when all hell seems to break loose in your life and you have to cling to God's word and trust in the empowerment of the Spirit to give you victory. See, the battle is ongoing. Let's not take it lightly. That is more real life. That's the normal Christian experience. One way to resist temptation is by asking the question, what's at stake? 
What am I willing to lose for a momentary pleasure? For the pleasures that we receive from temptation are nothing compared to the price we'll have to pay for it. As we come to our text in Matthew, we realize that we have the chapter break at the wrong place. The numbering of uh, chapters and verses in the Bible are not inspired. They're merely a human work to aid us in reading the Bible. But there are some instances where they get it wrong. And here is a clear example. And the baptism and the temptations of Jesus are interconnected and should not be divided into separate chapters. They both are not isolated stories, but are clearly interlinked. At his baptism, as well as during his temptation, Jesus hears a voice. They're contrasting voices coming from two different sources. At his baptism, Jesus hears the voice of his father affirming his identity. And during his temptation, Jesus hears another voice questioning the same identity that has been affirmed. What happened at the temptation of Jesus? Sorry, what happened at the baptism of Jesus? Look at uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. The baptism of Jesus was different from all other baptisms because this was not a display of his repentance. Jesus was sinless. He didn't have to repent of anything. But in his baptism, Jesus identifies with us as our representative head. Jesus is the second Adam the new leader of the human race. And this is a new genesis as God is going to establish his kingdom and renew all things. And at the very moment of his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus and he hears the voice of the Father affirming his identity. So this is a public revelation of the Son of God. And for the very first time in the Bible, we see the Trinity ever so clearly. Three distinct persons of the Godhead, all present in one place and seen in action. Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he hears the voice of God the Father. This is my beloved Son. In him I am well pleased. The word used is a term of endearment, signifying a deep and special bond with a favorite person. And when the Father says, I'm well pleased, the word signifies taking delight or pleasure in something or someone. But keep in mind, Jesus has just come off a long season of anonymity. He has not done anything of significance yet. 30 years of living in obscurity. Before Jesus ever did a miracle, preached a sermon, healed the sick, or performed any activity to extend the kingdom of God, came the words of assurance from the Father that he was deeply loved, appreciated, valued, and affirmed. And all through his life and ministry, Jesus operated out of this conviction. It was, the ministry was an outflow of who he was. And this is the way we all are called to live our life as beloved daughters and sons of God, for that is our true identity. Jesus is being publicly affirmed, filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit to indicate the official launch of his messianic ministry. It was like his ordination to launch an impactful, world-changing ministry. And you would think 
what would be a fitting start to his ministry will be a show of miracle or a life-changing sermon that will spellbound people or do something spectacular that signifies all that is about to unfold. And what do we see next? Jesus is going to disappear in a desert for 40 days where he will hear another voice. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 tells us, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mark's gospel says, at once the Spirit sent him into the wilderness. Jesus' hair was still wet with water from his baptism. And the same Holy Spirit who publicly came upon Jesus would now lead him or drive him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Oh, 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 wait a minute. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted? The Greek word used there for tempted can also be translated as tested. Temptation or test, it's the same Greek word. The context is what will determine which one it's referring to. Now, while we have made this whole episode as the temptations of Jesus, it can be said with equal conviction that this was a testing of Jesus. Testing and temptation are two sides of the same coin. The purpose of testing is to approve somebody, while the purpose of temptation is to trip someone. God tests. He never tempts. James chapter 1 verse 13 makes this so clear. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God does not tempt anyone. But over and over in the Bible, you see that God tests his people. And the testing is for our benefit. As a result of the testing, we will come out stronger. God tests, but the devil tempts. And he does this with a totally different objective, so that we will disobey God. At the start of his ministry, Satan wanted to tempt Jesus so he would fail in his mission. But God was going to use the same thing to use Jesus to strengthen him for his mission. That is true of us as well. Whatever you're wrestling with that is enticing you to disobey God is a test and a temptation. It is a test from God's point of view. God's intent and desire is that you will successfully pass this test, that you will be purified through this experience and come out stronger. A good teacher doesn't take delight in failing their students. In the same way, God urges us to successfully complete the test so we can graduate to the next level. But the enemy wants to use what is a test and turn it into a temptation, a snare that is meant to keep you from God's will for your life. Now, what was at stake when Jesus was tempted? Your salvation and mine was at stake. The sinless nature of Jesus hung in the balance. The stakes were high. If Jesus were to succumb to this temptation, he would cease to be a sinless savior, a lamb without blemish who can die for our sins. This would disqualify him from the mission of being the savior of the world. John Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, had also a sequel called Paradise Regained. And there, interestingly, he makes Jesus' temptation as the hinge event in his effort to regain the lost world. And one can say that this was the first of the many combats Jesus will have with the devil. And every time Jesus shows that he has come to destroy the works of the enemy. 
know, in order to fully understand the temptations of Jesus, we need to grasp two stories that are in the background of our text. They're the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Israel. Just as the story of Jesus begins with the temptation, so does the story of Adam and Eve. Created by God and placed in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had everything, communion with God, a life of perpetual happiness in the Garden, surrounded by the beauty of all of God's creation, they were blessed in every way. And when God said to them, you can eat of every tree except for this one, he was being generous. This is not a command from a stingy heart to keep them from enjoying life. But this was a, a test to see if they would live in obedience to God. And when Satan came with the temptation, this is what he said to Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The book of Genesis tells us that God made Adam and Eve in his own image. He spoke words of affirmation over them and he called his whole creation good. He fellowshiped with them in the garden. They heard the voice of God and they knew that they were his beloved children. And one day, now they hear the voice of the enemy and somehow the enemy manages to convince Adam and Eve to buy into this lie that God is not a good father, that he didn't have their best interests at heart. Somehow God was withholding something from them that they were not God's beloved treasure and they were missing out by following God's instructions. Now, if you were my enemy, the worst thing you can do to me is to convince my little kids that I don't love them or have their best interests at heart. That would be a diabolic thing to do. Nothing would hurt me more than that. And that's what the enemy wants to do with all of God's children. Make us question and doubt God's love for us. Hundreds of years after this incident in the Garden of Eden, we still hear two voices. The voice of God affirming us that we indeed are his beloved children, precious and loved. And then we hear the voice of the enemy that we are not loved that we need to take matter into our own hands and live independently of God. Temptation, in essence, is a battle between these two voices. When Adam and Eve gave into the temptation, they lost it all. The privilege of communion with God. The joy of being able to live in the garden. All of a sudden, work becomes a pain, childbearing becomes hard, death enters into the world, and all of creation feels the effect of the fall. And consequently, all human beings are born spiritually dead because of the original sin. So that's the first story in the background of our text. Here's the second story, the story of the nation of Israel. Israel, as God's chosen people, had many privileges as well. They were the people of the covenant, and God's plan and intention was to bless them so abundantly that the blessings will spill over and impact all other people groups as well. 
And the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. God delivered them from the iron hand of Pharaoh. Demonstrated to all of Egypt who is the one true God. He opened the Red Sea for his people to be able to walk on dry land. And they were now all set to reach the promised land. Now, over and over, God had spoken words of affirmation over them. There was just one small test left. By faith, they had to take possession of the land. To see whether they had the faith and the confidence to trust in God and take the step by faith. And Israel failed miserably. They refused to trust God and take that next step. A journey that should have taken them only about two weeks took 40 years, and an entire generation perished as they wandered aimlessly in the wilderness. And Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. The entire time in the wilderness was a time of testing for Israel. And what was the test about? Once again, it's the same battle between the two voices. While they were traveling in the wilderness, will they believe that they were still God's beloved children, or will they doubt their identity? Will they continue to hold on to God's love or will they question the love of God because of the hardships they encountered in the wilderness? Israel flunked the test. And as we come to Matthew chapter 4, we can see many parallels between the story of Adam and Eve, Israel, and Jesus. Jesus is recapitulating the story of Adam and Eve and the history of Israel in order to correct their failures. Jesus, in essence, is rewriting their story. Now watch this. Just as Israel goes to Egypt as exiles, Jesus also spends time in Egypt. The Israelites were, so to speak, baptized as they walked through the Red Sea, Jesus is now baptized in the Jordan River. Israel went into the wilderness to be tested by God, and now the Holy Spirit sends Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. The same number 40 appears. For Israel, it was 40 years. For Jesus, it was 40 days. Now, not only is Jesus the new Israel, but he's also the second Adam the new representative of the whole human race. What happens to Jesus affects every one of us. So what's at stake here? A lot. Everything hinges on how Jesus was going to respond. All along, humanity had failed in this cosmic conflict with Satan. Adam and Eve failed. Israel failed. And here comes Jesus. What's going to happen to him? And Jesus engages in this battle between two voices. He's heard the voice of his father speaking words of affirmation. But now here in the wilderness, he hears the mocking voice of the enemy, questioning God's love, urging Jesus to take matter into his own hands. After fasting 40 days, Days. Jesus is in dire need. The enemy was going to use Jesus' weakest, most vulnerable moment to question God's love for him. So this is the battle between the two voices. Which one was Jesus going to believe in? This is my beloved son or if you are the son of God. And if we, the readers of the gospel, notice this tension that Matthew is presenting to us, we, we say, of course, Jesus will triumph over the enemy. What else would you expect? He's God. He cannot be tempted like we are. If that's what we say, then clearly we don't understand the temptation narrative. 
Jesus fights this battle as a human. And not with special powers, but as a representative human being. He's not using any of his divine prerogatives here. He doesn't battle with the devil saying, I am Jesus, you better back off. And rather, he fights the battle like any of us would have to fight. Jesus depends on the same resources that have been given to us to depend on. The Holy Spirit's empowerment and the living word of God to overcome the devil. And he refuses to buy into the lie and question God's love. Jesus drives the stake on the ground and he says, I am the beloved son of God. That is my true identity. And I am not going to question God's love. And while the rest of the sermon series will emphasize our part in walking in victory, our role in the battle against temptation, today all I want to do is to elevate the victory of Jesus. The confrontation here in the wilderness is the first occasion in history that a son of Adam raises an effective defense against the enemy. In line with the prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, Jesus had come to crush the serpent's head. And as our representative, Jesus takes charge by redeeming our failures and rewriting the story of humanity. So when we are tempted, we don't have to follow the script of Adam and Eve or Israel, but we have a great example to follow in Jesus and walk in the victorious path that he has set for us. Now, what do you do in the middle of your temptation when the cravings are so strong? And everything inside of you wants something so badly that's not God's will for your life. How do you resist? It is by relying on Jesus who has already won the victory for us. When you're tempted, if all you are relying on is your willpower, surely it will let you down. But what can help you is the knowledge that you belong to a victorious Savior who has conquered the one who is tempting you. And because Jesus has won the decisive battle, we don't fight for victory, but we fight from victory. All of the resources, all of the ammunition that we need to stand up to the enemy has been given to us in Christ. And one thing we know, because Jesus has rewritten our story, what is true of Jesus is also true of us. And that moment when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we become part of God's family. And just as the Father spoke words of affirmation over Jesus, he speaks words of affirmation over you because you're covered by the blood of Jesus. And because Jesus has rewritten your story, you never ever have to question God's love for you. You don't have to listen to the voice of the enemy who wants you to doubt the Father's love. God the Father speaks the same words of affirmation over us today. You are my beloved son, and you are my beloved daughter, and you I am well pleased. That is our true identity. It is not earned through performance. We receive it by faith. And Jesus, who has won the decisive victory, makes himself available for us to come to our help in time of need. Hear these words from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So when we are enticed with a momentary pleasure that seems irresistible, that is calling us to disobey God, as God's children, we have the privilege to come into the very throne room of God. And where, what do we see in the throne room of God? We see Jesus, our high priest, who's interceding for us, and he's eager to give you the help that you need at the time of your temptation. Whatever temptation you may be facing, Jesus doesn't pile feelings of condemnation on you, but he wants to lift you up. So run to Jesus. Run to him when you feel the surge of temptation, the lure of the enemy, because the arms of Jesus are open wide for you. Let me say this in closing. We want this sermon series to be practical and not just offer you head knowledge, but we want to present to you some tools to help you overcome temptation in your life. Now, here's how I want us to apply the truth that we've heard today. When you face temptation, it's not if you face temptation, but when you face temptation, pause and ask the question, what's at stake? What am I going to lose by giving in to this temptation? What is hanging on the line? Just reflect on that for a moment. Process it in your mind. Have a conversation with yourself. Adam and Eve never realized the stakes, nor did Israel. When they caved in to the temptations, they had no idea what they were losing out. And neither do so many of us. Temptations look innocuous on the outside, but they are deadly. It promises one thing, but delivers something else. What you see is not what you get. And when we downplay the stakes, we minimize the cost to our own detriment. I just had a conversation recently with a lady who was dating the wrong guy. And her description of the person made it so obvious that this was not the person for her. But all she kept telling me was, I've been single for so long. And when I met this person, I thought, at last I have someone interested in me. It felt so good to finally receive some attention. So in the middle of a raging temptation like this, all this woman has to do is the simple exercise, pause, reflect on what would happen if this dating relationship continues, where will she end up? See, this is just plain wisdom. It's not rocket science. An honest introspection will help us go a long way in overcoming temptations. Pastor Andy Stanley puts it this way. When you give in to temptation, there's always more at stake than what we think. If you're young, you have a lot of future at stake. If you're old, you have a lot of legacy at stake. If you're in between, you have both future and legacy at stake. Now think about this. Because of not reflecting on this simple question in dealing with temptations, some have lost their family, their marriage, Finances, their career, their health, their integrity, and more importantly, their witness for Christ. The price of giving in is more than what we realize. So after you pause 
and factor in the consequences of your choices, you will find it much easier to run away from what looks enticing and run to Jesus, who's eager to help you in your time of desperate need. I'm going to ask all of us to stand as we come to an end. The hymn writer penned these beautiful words. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. When you face temptation, come to Jesus. If we handle the temptation in our own strength, we are bound to fail. The purpose of every temptation is to keep you from Jesus. And that is why when we turn to Jesus, we defeat the temptation. For when you turn to Jesus, in the middle of your temptation, you don't see a Jesus who is upset or mad at you. Rather, you see a faithful high priest who empathizes with your struggles who doesn't pile feelings of condemnation on you, but who identifies with your weaknesses. And he gives you the strength to walk in victory. I'm going to ask us to close our eyes right now and reflect on what you've heard. You know, in an audience of this size, all kinds of temptations are represented here. And yet at the root of it all, it is an enticement to disobey God. And I want to give an opportunity for you to just do that exercise that we talked about right now. If you're in the middle of a raging temptation, pause and reflect. What's at stake? Don't downplay the consequences. And as you realize what's at stake and the path that this will take you in, this is a good moment to ask Jesus, Jesus, I run to you. I need you. I don't want to live this way anymore. And I tell you, when you say that to Jesus, he is open with his arms wide to receive you and give you the strength that he promises so we can walk in victory. So I'm going to maintain a moment of silence, and after that, let's close in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for being our victorious Savior. And you walked in our steps and you lived a sinless life. You conquered every temptation. You conquered the evil one. And now you are ascended on high at the right hand of God. So we worship you. Thank you for purchasing us our salvation, our victory. I pray for every person here who is in the middle of a temptation, an enticement to disobey God. Lord, would you give them the strength that they need right now, the empowerment of your spirit and promises in your word that will sustain them and help them to walk in victory, to defeat the works of the enemy in their life that they will be able to embrace all of the plans and purposes that you have for them, that they will not miss out on anything. Pray, O oh God, that as we live in victory, may we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor, for you alone deserve it. 
And even as we leave this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the sweet, unfailing fellowship of the Holy Spirit may rest and abide with each and every one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Well, we have prayer partners available who will be happy to pray with you. God bless you. Partner with us by giving to what God is doing in and through Center Street Church. Click on Give to learn more. If you are in the Calgary and area region, we invite you to visit one of our five campuses next weekend. Click on Find a Campus Near Me and come say hello. We look forward to meeting you and helping you find a place to belong, grow, and learn about God.